Media Lab, Danielle Wood, and our moderator, anchor for Bloomberg Television, Manus Cranny. Ladies, gentlemen, good afternoon. I think we've technically broken into the afternoon. This is probably one of the heaviest hitting panels that I've ever done. I've got two engineers and one mathematician. So these ladies are going to open your imagination and take you to somewhere perhaps that you've never really thought about going. We're talking about space. It is T minus 60, the, the race. But what I want to do here is I want to bring the opportunities to life. Perhaps you've never really thought about commodity trading. Well, Flavia is going to make that come alive. So we're going to start with the biggest opportunities that they are. Flavia, let's kick it off. You're in Australia. You've been there 10 years. You've raised capital. But you blew my mind with what it is that you put into space and what you do. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning. And uh, yeah, so glad to be in this beautiful city. So thanks, Singapore, for hosting all of us with our space ambitions. I am based in South Australia, Adelaide, uh, Italian rocket scientist and founded a company seven years ago that has gone through, it's gone very well. <laughs> um, we have a constellation of satellites for, um, we look for critical minerals. So we use satellites to find lithium, copper, and all the minerals that are important for the energy transition. Um, I've been a space nerd since a young age. Now I'm a CEO, so I've got a different job. But uh, I've been always fascinated about the ability to just bring space to a normal entrepreneur. So as you can see, you got three women here. You don't have Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, or Richard Branson, but we are building some incredible uh, space activities all around the world. So we use our satellites, and it, you know, in Australia, mining is, is a very big industry. Mm -hmm. I'm very passionate about the energy transition and uh, batteries and uh, all the growth that this will require in the next 20 years. So we found a solution to use very small satellites, kind of changing the infrastructure cost in the sky to enable new business models on Earth. And we found this amazing application that allows us to look for critical minerals and allow customers and around the world not to drill as much. OK, I, and we'll come back to that. There's so, some pretty impressive stats in, in terms of the, the sustainability. So the satellites that you put up there, the I think the smallest one is the size of a pizza box. The woman who's going to revolutionize how we connect with one another in space, build in space, transport in space, it is Hélène. Infrastructure. Uh, I mean, when we got together on Zoom, Hélène, you said, OK, Manus, we've got two space stations at the moment, and the objective is probably 8 to 10. Now, how quickly do we get there? Is that burning ambition, or is that reality? And is that an opportunity? Yeah, so Probably, I don't know, not all of you realize, but indeed when we look up there, we have two space stations, uh, let's say, uh, orbiting around the Earth. So indeed one Chinese and the International Space Station. If we now place ourselves 10 years ahead, probably there'll be around eight space stations, two around the Moon, and around about six around the Earth. So probably one Indian, probably two to three private American space stations, and potentially an additional Russian one and the ISS probably will be down by then. So basically, it's a 400% growth of in-space infrastructure. And uh, that's an opportunity for us on Earth, of course, because on the one hand, it's basically building our future as human species. Before we go to Mars, the first step, of course, is to learn how to live up there and then how to learn, to learn how to live around the moon, basically. And for the Earth, uh, we can manufacture in space, we can do in space things we cannot do on Earth. For example, we can do research on cancer in space, we can grow crops in space, that things that we couldn't do in Earth. And we also, while being in space actually, uh, we face very important challenges in terms of uh, energy storage, in terms of new types of batteries. I just take the moon as an example. If you want to stay like six weeks on the moon, you'll have to sustain minimum once what is called lunar night, which is minus 200 degrees. 14 days of night, so it means if we want to do that, we'll have simply to find completely new technologies in terms of batteries and energy storage. So that's basically a huge boomerang effect back. And what we're doing at the exploration company is basically we're providing the transportation system so that we can go to these stations. So we're building a spaceship, uh, which is launcher agnostic, can be launched by SpaceX, can be launched by Ariane, can be launched by Indian launchers. And basically once we are launched, we go to stations, 
around the Earth. We go to stations around the moon, we can refuel our vehicle, and then we come back, and then we reuse the vehicle again. So that's basically what we're doing. And the first time in the world with green propellant. So actually, we are one of the first, I think, the first company in the world really contributing to build a space transportation ecosystem which is sustainable. And, and that is when you begin to stop squabbling over 2 or 3% growth in China, and you begin to blow your own mind and think, where is the next 10 years of growth? And, and after the Zoom call with each of these three ladies, it was like, yeah, you know what? I need to stop talking about macroeconomics with China and the United States of America and start talking about the next 20 years in space. Now, Danielle, you made it very clear to me that the imagery that's in most of this mind here is, dare I say it, maybe some of the launches that we saw this year, defense uh, and intelligence as a result of the Ukraine war made some of these issues come alive. But you say, I need to go beyond that. It's about space being a public utility, which goes back to the very principles of the UN. Uh, when, when fresh regulation came in. What do you mean by that, that space is beyond the public utility, more than just a public utility, or should become a public utility? I love building on the examples my colleagues here have given. And the thing I want to highlight, as you've been saying, is that in the next few years, we're going to see humans do activities in space that will fundamentally shift our relationship with locations beyond Earth. It means we're going to, as you say, see lots of new activity in orbit around the Earth, as well as on the Moon, and all of that feeds back into service to Earth. So part of my job is to help us remember both the opportunities and the challenges that are coming up. Because right now, we can use space technology that already exists to help meet sustainable development goals as identified by the United Nations. But we can also ask, what sustainability challenges are we creating in space? And you're already thinking about addressing. And which ones do you want to avoid? So space is what we call global commons. The United Nations did a really excellent work even back in the 60s in the midst of the opening of the Cold War, amazing teams came together from many countries and wrote a set of treaties. And this is the first idea that I wanted to make sure people hear. People sometimes come to me and they ask, oh, what's going to happen in space because there's so much uh, freedom of action and there's no one with any rules? I said, no, no, actually. And this is part of the myth busting that you wanted to present, which I is do. the first myth to bust is? There are rules in space, but they come through international law, and then they are implemented by national governments. So there are a number of treaties, and most countries participating in space have signed the, the key ones, especially the Outer Space Treaty and a few other key ones to make sure we don't arrest each other as astronauts if you have an accident and to see how we can uh, coordinate on liability. So there's a number of great and actually quite noble, I think, uh, writings about international space law. And most countries operating in space have signed these and made them domestic law. And those domestic laws are applied to any private activity happening in space, which is good news. It means that companies that are starting in space do have guidelines they have to follow. It also means we gather with the United Nations in a committee called the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space every year in Vienna, and there's ongoing debate and dialogue among countries about how to coordinate these exciting new activities that are coming in space. And those UN principles are peaceful purposes, accessible to all countries, and benefits of all countries, and every state is internationally responsible for the junk you leave behind. We'll come to junk in just a moment. It's amazing, actually, what you begin to read when, when you prepare for something which is slightly off your own beat. So one word which has permeated across uh, the conversation so far is about sustainability. So, uh, Flavia, when you and I caught up, you talked about there's 5 million drill holes, the success rate is 0.5%, and what you can do in your world is dramatically improve the hit ratio and perhaps the carbon footprint for big miners. Make it come alive for the audience. So what you all need to understand that, you know, probably you look at the space industry and you think, what, what is going on? Why there are billion dollars of investment in a reusable rocket or people going to go around uh, and have a look at Earth? There is a lot of money invested in this industry and they're from Visiland to P to Growth Fund. It's been incredible in the past 20 years. But I think the key to understand is that space that's always been very infrastructure heavy, very expensive, mm. just for few, but this has been changing. So when you change that, and it really changed with softer entrepreneur entering into the space industry, right? Kind of changing a little bit the dynamics, you are enable a different way to do space. So look at Elon Musk, right? Elon Musk had an incredible idea to reuse rocket to launch satellites. You probably think what does it have to do with anything, right? 
reality is that in the past five years, five years ago, I was launching one of my satellites for a million of dollars. Now it cost me a couple of hundred K. So in four years, the economics has changed. So it really allowed my business to flourish. So he launches my satellite with his rocket, and I find critical minerals for Tesla. And then suddenly, space become an enabler of really big problems for Earth. So you create that cycle that can just be disrupted when you have reusable rockets or small satellites. My satellites are 3D printed and very, very small. So there's a lot of very scientific, complicated things up there, but they're solving problems here. You know, the 5 million drill holes with 0.5% of, of uh, finding radon deposit is an alarming stat because we need 40 times more lithium, 6 times more copper, nickel, cobalt. So this mining industry is going to become, in reality, the energy transition is a mining industry transition that is counterintuitive because we are trying to save the world by moving into renewable energy. And to do that, we need to drill this planet. So this is not just about billionaire going to space. This is not about people that understand or not understand what is our propulsion system. This is about the fundamentals of our economy. Okay, Len, you make it come alive in terms of what we're going to do up there. You propel us there. That's part of one of your, your missions uh, to get up there. But when you've got infrastructure up there, what's going to happen next? Um, Talk to me about what happens in 10 years' time. What are we going to build up there? What are we going to transport up there? How is it going to be? Yeah, so I think what we're going to see uh, around about 10 years is uh, basically on the Earth, more and more infrastructures. So we're going to have living infrastructures for astronauts, but also for tourists. And it starts with billionaires. You know, you can think about the beginning of the aviation industry. It also was starting with billionaires, and now it has communalized. So probably not in 10 years, but we'll see that, I think, longer down the road in space. It took around about 70 years for the aviation, basically. Uh, that's the, basically the time frame between the first tourists and the creation of Ryanair. <laughs> uh, we're also going to see in space, I think, around the Earth, um, strategic slash military infrastructures for the very simple reason of what Flavia was mentioning. Uh, space is becoming more and more critical for Earth in terms of imagery, which enable us to optimize agricultural logistics climate, in terms of communication, you're doing IoT communication, but also broadband communication. So if you think about in 10 years, like 50, 60% of our broadband communication is going to come from space, for example, and that's going to be a critical infrastructure for every autonom autonomous cars. And then you add to that positioning, you immediately see that if these infrastructures are being hacked or being destroyed, we're going to have huge problem on Earth. So there is a critical need to protect this critical infrastructure and to protect these critical infrastructures. I think we're going to see in space military infrastructures, mm. storage, but also capacity for spaceships or vehicles uh, that can remove threats, can be debris. So this is for space sustainability, can be also other kind of threats. Um, that basi and basically these vehicles uh, will also have the need to refuel because they need a high velocity on the one hand, and they need also the capacity to stay in their, I would say, operational uh, area. Uh, and this means refueling. So I think what we're going to see around the Earth in 10 years is on the one hand, a commercialization with space tourism, with infrastructure to basically be a research platform from the Earth. Mm -hmm. So using microgravity for discovering new types of crops, um, doing a lot of progress in medicine, so that's a research platform basically. And on the one hand, on the other hand, sorry, basically strategic military infrastructures, mm -hmm. basically to protect this critical communication positioning and Earth observation infrastructures that will have become absolutely critical for life on Earth. And Danielle, that's where I want to bring you into the conversation. By the way, I, I, I get the funny feeling that it's going to be she who discovers the energy complex on the dark side of the moon is probably going to be the winner in this race, not, not Jeff or, or, or Elon <laughs> or Richard. Um, we'll come to those in a moment. There's a question from the audience. Everybody, please pop a question in. This is not my show. This is your show. Uh, pop a question in. Ask the question that perhaps I haven't thought of. Uh, but, Danielle, to, to you, when we chatted, you say, but, Manus, there are no weapons of mass destruction. We're in the midst of a, a Ukraine-Russia war. The hyperbola in the media is, of course, the weaponization of space. We've seen Elon Musk do the good with Starlink for Ukraine. Um, 
But again, to that point that Hélène just made in terms of the weaponization of space, how real is that or is the world strong enough to make sure it doesn't happen? Right. So loving the, the history you're all bringing, I was going to add the idea that you talked about the changes in launch costs. And I think we also want to bring in, the way you mentioned was the small te satellite technology, which is also a series of universities and small companies that have demonstrated how we can build things with smaller systems, also leveraging the technologies in our phones, for example. And so this helps us think about your question. First, people might hear a headline, such as like the United States opening a space force, and think that something brand new is happening. But we have to recall that there's been military activity since the beginning of the space era. The military is really far outspending everyone else, especially in the US, in space. So that's not changing. The questions are going to become, I think, like Helene said, what does it mean for militaries to find that their need to support their national assets is both on Earth and in space? What's exciting to ask is, what are the opportunities because of the mutual interdependence that we'll continue to have uh, in space in a way that's also real on Earth? And I think the next phase is noting that there's many more players than maybe we're giving credit to. Uh, my team, we build prototypes of systems that can promote sustainability on Earth and in space. And one example is low-cost sensors to make measurements for science. We've been invited by the United Arab Emirates uh, to include a very small and simple payload on their rover, which is going to the moon soon. And we're just one of many scientific payloads of flying along with a rover led by the United Arab Emirates. And that's just one example of the broad set of countries that are coming into play uh, in every continent who have their own national space agenda. And so the space conversation isn't just around the major players that we might think of, like US and China, which are, of course, very active. Uh, it's also, you know, every part of the global north and south where every continent is seeing a change. So international relations is happening both on the ground and in space. One example to consider is um, the new African continent-wide agency for space, which is then supporting uh, the work of also multiple national agencies in countries like South Africa, Benin, Ghana, uh, places like uh, Rwanda, where there are activities in space either to apply applications or uh, to do work to have a national capability in space. So again, I, another propulsion. We've got a couple of questions from the audience, so let's ask you these. Um, Okay, very quick response on, on these, ladies, if you will. Uh, how concerned are you that Elon Musk's focus on Twitter is a distraction on the important work of SpaceX? A, a quick response, Ellen. Do you think it's a distraction yeah, I mean, to the space race? I think Elon has proven that he can do many things at the same time with uh, SpaceX and Tesla, so I'm not really worried. <laughs> Flavia. Mm, it should be okay. I think he has demonstrated a lot and uh, and maybe the distraction will be useful for the companies to work mm. more calmly. <laughs> we shall see. Okay. Uh, the other question that's come in, um, Danielle, why don't you take this, which is which country is winning the space race? Interesting use of word race rather than uh, war. Which country do you think is leading, mm. leading the way, leading the charge? European, Australian, we have on the panel. China. Uh, <laughs> no, I would, yeah. There is, you know, yeah. if you look how many rocket uh, companies are built in China, we, you guys just don't know. Like China has got m most of the satellite company in the world. They've got five, six, seven, eight rockets that work. They're doing so a good job. China's way out ahead. Danielle, for you, who's winning the space race? I mean, how do we define space race? But who, who is perhaps the most innovative, doing perhaps the most futuristic work that we need to talk more about? In a way, I think it's the wrong question because I think the question will be, uh, which countries are going to set an example for the behavior that we want to see repeated in space in the future. So the question I'm asking is, as we're seeing the first activities where humans will stay through multiple lunar nights on the moon, as that becomes a reality, as we start to create infrastructure, we have key questions to ask that are going to set a precedent. Once one team has a longer term base on the moon, for example, or once one team operates or perhaps is engaging in mining on the moon or uh, you know, other locations like ast uh, asteroids, this is going to set a precedent that then will either be rejected or copied by other players. And I see possible futures. I think I really appreciated the earlier discussion on we may not predict the future, but we should plan for the possible futures that can, can come. Mm -hmm. I see a case where China takes a direct you know, action that then sets an example that either the global community is proud of or has concerns about. And I see a need for debating that hopefully before uh, I think mistakes are made. So I think the moon is small and we want to protect it from uh, basically from pollution. And you lead the, the, the European initiatives you have done in the past, Ellen. So are you going to be nationalistic or are you going to agree that maybe the Chinese might be out ahead? No, I think it depends from, uh, let's say, which point of view you look at. Uh, if you look basically, I think, of who's done the most uh, impressive progress in the past 20 years, mm -hmm. 
I would agree with Clivea. I think, I mean, China is very, very impressive. If we look at where China was like 20 years ago and where China is today, it's very, very impressive. Mm. Uh, and let's remember that China was the first to land at the dark face of, of the moon, which from a technical perspective is a huge challenge. Now, if we look at who has the most, let's say, innovative idea and has been absolutely transformational for the space sector, of course, it's Elon Musk. So I'm not saying the United States, I'm saying Elon Musk and SpaceX. And uh, what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to there. build in Europe, and I think that's extremely important actually, as I told you, we are the first uh, space transportation company using green propellant for a very big vehicle. So you can think of, our SpaceX basically is, um, you know, around about 10 ton. It's going to carry around about four ton to space stations, around about three tons to the moon. And we are also the first in the world to open source our brain system and to share that with others. And for me, this is the very core DNA of Europe, which is about cooperation. Mm -hmm. And we will not be able to create a sustainable space ecosystem, a cooperative one, if we, as European, we are not strong. And of course, I'm building a very profitable company. I have raised a lot of private money. Uh, I'm, so I'm very successful in raising money and delivering. So there is no point that we are here, you know, to basically to, uh, you know, to do philanthropy, but I also <laughs> want the company to embody the core value of Europe, which is about cooperation. Yes. And I think this is absolutely needed in space yeah. today. And this is where Europe can play a leading role, actually. So to answer your question is depending on which you point. Fastest growth, China, most innovative, Musk, and I think cooperation, Europe needs to take a leading position here. If I may, I yes, just jump in on the, the pronouncement of Musk as an individual, because I think we can't take, se separate that from the idea that uh, government policies, in this case from NASA, for example, have been right in step, meaning uh, Musk wouldn't be where they are currently, and the, the RARA team wouldn't be where they are, if the government wasn't also agreeing to partner with them to create marketplaces for the kind of work they're yep. doing. So I think there's lots of funding, but also technical support and engagement between SpaceX, in this case, and, and NASA, which is part of government policy to say we want companies to have these capabilities. So I think it's great to see that individual visionaries are there, but they're part of big teams that have sort of years of government and engagement. So I think adding that is important to the only message I have to investors to say, if you are considering investing in a space company, uh, ask what role the government does play or might play mm -hmm. that becomes part of the anchor market, the anchor tenant, you might say, on a space station, for example, because that's probably going to still be important for years to come, which I think is not a bad thing, because space is a public utility, going back to an earlier Indeed. question. It provides public services. Very briefly, because time, the clock ticks down, and the one thing that fascinates my mind is about asset management, portfolio management, and this room is filled, uh, and indeed beyond, the audience beyond, with investors. You don't need capital, you're oversubscribed. You're open to capital, and you're open to capital. How much do people here in this audience and beyond need to begin to understand about allocation of capital to space and beyond? Very briefly, in 20 seconds each. Ellen. Okay, so I think space is a business, basically, where the winner takes it all. So if you invest in space, I would recommend that you really look into the technology and to make sure that the company is at the down of the market and able to basically become number one or number two in this market in the next five to 10 years. Are you going to be then, number one And then you have the, the winning infrastructure, basically. Are Sorry? you going to be number one and number two in the next five to of 10 course. years? Of course. She's already <laughs> is number one. Flavia. Uh, for me, what I've learned, I'm, I'm, I'm finalizing our COC raise, it's a really big one. What I've learned is if you're a good tech and you have a market fee that is not as uh, common when you have a space company. So if your revenue is very, very high, it's rare. It's rare. You have revenue. Rare. Lots. There okay. you go. So that, yeah. it is very rare. And it's <laughs> fascinating for an Australian company go to Silicon Valley and really receiving the impact, the, the answer to say, yeah, it's rare. It's amazing. Yeah. Danielle, the closing line to you in terms of, I know it's the MIT media director, but, but you know, capital is important to you as well, isn't it? Sure. We're asking companies through our project called the Space Sustainability Rating to voluntary, voluntarily participate in a way to show their, basically their environmental sustainability commitment. So it's a way that private sector can help address a challenge that is not being fully addressed by governments. Uh, so that's part of our work. It's such a pleasure to say, ladies, thank you very much for being with me. I could include myself, but I'm not that, I'm not that egotistical. <laughs> Ellen Ubi, Flavia Tata Nardini, and Danielle Wood, your you. team minus 60, race for capital and beyond. Beam me up. Good morning, good afternoon. <laughs>